The Indisputable Humanity of Anders Bering Brevik. Mencius Moldbug. July 25, 2011. Unqualified Reservations. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. The Indisputable Humanity of Anders Bering Brevik. It's pathetic but typical, I feel, that the likes of Robert Spencer and Fjordman are denying their connection to Anders Bering Brevik. Of course they are responsible for Brevik's terrorism, just as communist intellectuals are responsible for Islamic terrorism. Someone skipped Aesop. The trumpeter taken prisoner. A trumpeter, being taken prisoner in battle, begged hard for quarter, declaring his innocence and protesting that he neither had killed nor could kill any man, bearing no arms but his trumpet, which he was obliged to sound at the word of command. For that reason, replied his enemies, we are determined not to spare you, for though you yourself never fight, yet with that wicked instrument of yours, you blow up animosity among other people, and so become the cause of much bloodshed. Application The fomenter of mischief is at least as culpable as he who puts it in execution. A man may be guilty of murder who never has handled a sword or pulled a trigger or lifted up his arm with any mischievous weapon. There is a little incendiary called the tongue, which is more venomous than a poisoned arrow, and more killing than a two-edged sword. The moral of the fable therefore is this, that if in any civil insurrection the persons taken in arms against the government, deserve to die, much more do they whose devilish tongues or pens gave birth to the sedition and excited the tumult. The fable is also equally applicable to those evil counselors, who excite corrupt or wicked governments to sap and undermine, and then to overturn the just laws and liberties of a whole people. Aesop, you see, is above the whole thing. Aesop has no problem with putting the hammer to either seditious rabble-rousers or tyrannical commissars. He accepts it as normal. It is normal. It is war, and only the dead have seen the end of war. The trumpeter, on either side, is a soldier. This mental habit of separating democratic dissent and violent terrorism, which the Robert Spencers of the world vainly attempt to invoke, and the Noam Chomsky successfully invoke, is one of the most curious psychological ticks of the deranged 20th century. Of course its raison d'etre, as a psychological warfare device, is to forestall the realization that leftist movements achieve power through violence, then demand pacifism of the subjugated. All power is rooted in violence, even electoral power, to the extent that any such thing still exists. There is most definitely a continuum between democratic activism and civil war. The struggle for power is one. The whole point of the classic picket sign is that the writing on the cardboard sends one message, the two by four it's stapled to sends another. And we can tell that left rules right, because we can see that Noam Chomsky has the right to trumpet his ideas to Osama bin Laden, whereas Robert Spencer does not have the right to trumpet his ideas to Anders Bering Brevik. Did he think he had that right? He had not the might, so he had not the right. He's finding that out right now, as he stares down the barrel of a very angry New York Times. The trumpeter game, version left, is played ad nauseum in every school system in the world today. All our noble workers and peasants are constantly inculcated with two messages. First, you are the victim of injustice. Second, even though you are the victim of injustice, violence is evil and you must under no circumstances punish the guilty. Human beings are human beings, of course, so the second message doesn't always take. Ah. Another random attack. Robert Spencer, Fjordman, and the like, even so perspicacious a conservative as Lawrence Oster thought they could play this game from the other side. Why? Because they believe in the game. They believe in democratic activism, and they believe they live in a democratic society and have just as much right as anyone at Harvard to toot their trumpets. They are wrong on every count. What every conservative, moderate or extreme, needs to learn from ABB is that all action by the powerless, violent or non-violent, is misguided. It is not wrong, of course, to aspire to power, but action does not create power. Action dissipates power. Until you amass the power to capture the state, refrain from any action whatsoever, certainly including voting. The weak have no right to oppose the strong. And then there's the insanity angle. In case anyone has any doubt about Brevik's sanity, I thought I'd cut and paste the most interesting parts of his manifesto, which are naturally the parts everyone is ignoring. Not the endless Fjordman essays, but his own personal story. Page 1393. Q. Violent Muslim gangs in European cities are not exactly a new phenomenon. We hear about indigenous European youths getting harassed, beaten, raped and robbed quite often. Tell us about your experiences during your vulnerable years, 14 to 18, growing up in the urban multicultural streets of Oslo. A. Since I was 12 years old I was into the hip-hop movement. For several years I was one of the most notable hip-hoppers from Oslo's west side. 
It was a lot easier to gain respect and credibility in Oslo West because of the demographic factors. Oslo West was the privileged and predominantly native side of Oslo with very few immigrants in contrast to the east side which was less peaceful. Graffiti and break dance was an important part of our life at that point. Around 1993 and 1994, at 15, I was the most active tagger, graffiti artist, in Oslo as several people in the old school hip-hop community can attest to. Our standard graffiti raid consisted of going out at night, in groups of two to three, with our backpacks full of spray cans. We took our bikes and bombed city blocks with our tags, pieces and crew name all over Oslo. Morg, Wick and Spock was everywhere. The fact that hundreds of kids our own age all over Oslo West and even Oslo East looked up to us was one of the driving forces I guess. At that time it felt very rewarding to us. If you wanted girls and respect then it was all about the hip-hop community at that time. The more reckless you were the more respect and admiration you gained. Everyone didn't approve though. The government had a no-tolerance attitude towards graffiti and removed 90% of our creations within 48 hours. I remember it was an unofficial war between the hip-hop community and the government and Oslo Sporvier, our public subway company. Two guys I knew, Stia and Charles, a few years older than me were arrested, received gigantic fines and was put in jail. The hip-hop movement in Norway had its climax around that time, in 92-93. The community was very politically correct in nature with close ties to the extreme left groups like SOS Ross Eisen, an extreme left-wing movement, and Blitz, a violent left-wing extremist movement. I remember we used to hang out with various people and groups all over Oslo. There were plenty of hip-hop concerts at Blitz and it was at this time that the communist hip-hop group, Goddess Parliament was created. It's hard to imagine but during this time everyone was into graffiti and hip-hop, we used to hang out with GSV crew, or be Gangan as they are popularly called today, a Muslim Pakistani gang, quite violent even back then. Gang alliances was a part of our everyday life at that point and assured that you avoided threats and harassment. Alliances with the right people guaranteed safe passage everywhere without the risk of being subdued and robbed, jizya, beaten or harassed. We had close ties with B-Gangan, B-Gang, and A-Gangan, A-Gang, both Muslim Pakistani gangs through my best friend Arsalan who was also a Pakistani. Even at that time, the Muslim gangs were very dominating in Oslo East and in inner city Oslo. They even arranged raids in Oslo West occasionally, subduing the native youths, kufars, and collecting jizya from them, in the form of cell phones, cash, sunglasses etc. I remember they systematically harassed, robbed and beat ethnic Norwegian youngsters who were unfortunate enough to not have the right affiliations. Muslim youths called the ethnic Norwegians pateter, potatoes, a derogatory term used by Muslims to describe ethnic Norwegians. These people occasionally raped the so-called potato whores. In Oslo, as an ethnic Norwegian youth aged 14 to 18 you were restricted if you didn't have affiliations to the Muslim gangs. Your travel was restricted to your own neighborhoods in Oslo West and certain central points in the city. Unless you had Muslim contacts you could easily be subject to harassment, beatings and robbery. Our alliances with the Muslim gangs were strictly seen as a necessity for us, at least for me. We, however, due to our alliances had the freedom of movement. As a result of our alliances we were allowed to have a relaxing and secure position on the west side of Oslo among our age group. Think of it as being local warlords for certain Kufar areas, which were regulated by the only dominant force, Muslim gangs collaborating with anarcho-Marxist networks. Many of these groups claim to be tolerant and anti-fascist, but yet, I have never met anyone as hypocritical, racist and fascist as the people whom I used to call friends and allies. The media glorifies them while they wreak havoc across the city, rob and plunder. Yet, any attempts their victims do to consolidate are harshly condemned by all aspects of the cultural establishment as racism and, and Nazism. I have witnessed the double standards and hypocrisy with my own eyes, it is hard to ignore. I was one of the protected potatoes, having friends and allies in the jihadi racist gangs such as the ANB gang and many other Muslim gangs. I gradually became appalled by the mentality, actions and hypocrisy of what he calls the Marxist jihadi youth movement of Oslo disguised under more socially acceptable brands such as, SOS Rasism, Youth Against Racism, Blitz who literally hijacked segments of the hip-hop movement and used it as a front for recruitment. I have personally heard of and witnessed hundreds of jihadi racist attacks, more than 90% of them aimed at helpless Norwegian youth, who themselves are brought up to be suicidally tolerant and therefore are completely unprepared mentally for attacks such as these. This happens while the Marxist networks in the hip-hop movement and the cultural establishment silently and indirectly condone it. There is absolutely no political will to ensure that justice is served on behalf of these victims. 
I remember at one point thinking, this system makes me sick. Q. Did you ever contribute to the Muslim atrocities against the indigenous during this period? A. I saw the security alliances in a strictly pragmatical way. They were a necessary evil at that time. During these years I heard of hundreds of cases where ethnic Norwegians were harassed, robbed and beaten by Muslim gangs. This type of behavior was in fact acts of racism or even based on religious motives, jihadi behavior, although I failed to see the connection then due to lack of knowledge about Islam. I saw the practical manifestations, and I didn't like it at all. The only thing you could do was to take the necessary precautions, create alliances or be subdued by them. If you made any attempt to create a Norwegian gang you would be instantly labeled as a Nazi and face the wrath of everyone, in addition to the Muslim gangs. They, however, were allowed to do anything while being indirectly cheered by society. So in other words, we were trapped between the wood and the bark. This is still the case in all Western European major cities. They are allowed to consolidate, while we are not. The lefty slash hip-hop movement, including the Pakistani gangs and other minority gangs, in cooperation with SOS Ross Eisman Blitz were notorically and systematically violent, even racist and discriminating towards ethnic Norwegian youths and anti-immigrant individuals. They abused drugs and many were involved in criminal activity, yet cheered by the media because of their tolerance and so-called anti-racist attitude. Intolerance, Racism and acts of jihad were tolerated against native Norwegians as the perpetrators were categorized as victims by default, as minorities. They were seldom punished properly. I remember the occasional crackdowns on right-wing youth movements during this period. The police raided them several times, called their parents and invested a lot of resources on squashing the right-wing movement all over Norway. Blitz and other extreme left, SOS Ross Eisman and the hip-hop community on the other hand received public funding. The Blitz House, a building they had occupied a few decades earlier, was subsidized and under protection by the government in Oslo and still is even today. They are often referred to as the storm troops of the Norwegian Labour Party. The government subsidy of the apartment block where Blitz resides equates to more than 3 million US dollars per year alone. The violent Marxist group SOS Rossism receives 2 not 3 million annually. It's disgusting. When my friendship with Arsalan, John Trigby and Richard ended, I pursued and further developed a friendship with my old friends Marius and Chrisen who lived in my neighborhood. They were to become my new core of close friends. I also befriended myself with a predominantly ethnic Norwegian gang from Tassin in Oslo. Some of them were active on the graffiti front from earlier and that's how I first met them. This new alliance was also quite useful to create security for the rest of our vulnerable years. I remember once when a gang of Moroccans came to Tassin, a predominantly ethnic Norwegian area in the northern part of Oslo and tried to rob a couple of ethnic local youths. The Moroccan gang was well known for being notoriously violent, having robbed and beaten hundreds of ethnic Norwegian youths all over Oslo. We were at a party at that time. As we heard of the incident we rallied around 20 guys and found the Moroccans near the subway station. We made a deal with them telling them to never come back for their so-called jizya raids. They never showed their face on Tassin again as far as I know. Muslim gangs respect people who respect themselves which is why they have no respect for people who are not prepared to use violence. As time went by and we started high school at around 17 to 18, the situation changed drastically. The need for security decreased considerably during this period, mostly because we kept to certain areas. Individuals affiliated with the Muslim gangs were academically weak and were basically left behind or they selected practical professional studies like mechanics courses or carpentry. Very few of them had the grades to enter any quality schools in Oslo West. In this regard the need for security vanished and a type of academic segregation occurred. In retrospect, it's easy to understand why ethnic Norwegians are fleeing Muslim areas. No one likes to be subdued live in fear, being harassed, beaten and robbed. The Muslim ghettofication process has been ongoing the last 30 years and it will continue until there is close to 100% concentrated Muslim areas in Oslo, the same tendency we see in Paris. London and other large Western European cities. When I was around 15 to 16 there was only one or two schools where the majority was non-ethnic Norwegian. Now, 15 years later there are around 50 schools on the east side of Oslo where the majority of students are non-natives and primarily Muslim. It's a miracle how I managed to successfully pass through my vulnerable years without being subdued by Muslim gangs even once. I know that there are hundreds, even thousands of incidents per year, I have personally witnessed around 50 incidents, where ethnic Norwegian youths ranging 14 to 18 are harassed, beaten, raped and robbed and it's getting worse every year. I really don't envy the new generations and the challenges that are facing them regarding Muslim subjugation. 
If ethnic Norwegian youth or other non-Muslims attempt to create gangs of their own, for protection purposes, they are immediately labeled as racists and Nazis. At the same time numerous Muslim gangs commit thousands of racist acts each year against ethnic Norwegians and it's either hushed down, ignored and therefore tolerated. The last 20 years more than 100 to 200 ethnic Norwegians have been killed by Muslims, a majority by racist or religious slash jihadi motives. Yet, the press are systematically ignoring this and they attempt to link every single incident to non-relevant motives like for example the influence of narcotics slash alcohol or blame the accused Muslim of being psychologically unstable. Norwegian media refuse to face the truth of the matter which is that most of these incidents are religiously and or racially motivated. The only incident I can remember where a racist native have killed a non-white was the murder of Benjamin Hermansen, who at the age of 15 years, was murdered in Holnia, in Oslo, Norway. The death was racially motivated. The murder mobilized large parts of the Norwegian population. Throughout the entire country, marches were organized to protest against the murder, with nearly 40,000 people participating in Oslo. The Benjamin Prize was established as a Norwegian prize to counter racism in 2002. The prize is awarded to a school that actively works against racism and discrimination. Could this have happened if the victim was native and the aggressors were Muslims? No, not in a million years. Our politicians are terrified of offending the Muslim community in any way. Also, more than 80% of our parliamentarians have never experienced Muslim gangs with all its ugly manifestations. A great majority of them haven't even been raised in Oslo, or any large European city with small but dominant Muslim minorities. They usually move to Oslo as adults and settle in the non-Muslim areas of the city. Our parliamentarians and media are completely unplugged from reality, they don't know what's going on or they don't want to know. On the other hand, the new generations that have experienced this development the last two decades are all urban, young individuals under 30 to 35 years. I'm quite sure the majority of them now vote the Progress Party, Norway's only anti-immigration party. Several statistics indicate that indigenous Europeans in Muslim-dominated areas oppose mass Muslim immigration. Oslo used to be a peaceful city. Thanks to the Norwegian cultural Marxist-slash-multiculturalist regime they have transformed my beloved city into a broken city, a bunkered society, a multiculturalist shithole where no one is safe anymore, to use blunt language? The following is an overview of experiences I have had during my youth in Oslo. I've only experienced eight assaults, attempted robberies and multiple threats. I've never actually been severely ravaged, robbed or beaten by Muslims, a broken nose is the worst thing that occurred, but I know more than 20 people who have. I know at least two girls that have been raped by Muslims and I am familiar with two more cases in my broader network, one gang rape. One girl though was cut badly in the face by Muslims. As such, I guess I should feel lucky or privileged. I live in Oslo West far away from the nearest Muslim enclave as more or less all of them are localized on Oslo East. There is little difference in their level of aggressiveness among the various Muslim groups, regardless if they are from Pakistan, Iraq, Turkey, Morocco or Albania. I do, however, acknowledge that only a small proportion of Muslims are so-called jihadi youth but this argument is defeated by the mere fact that the same thing can be said about the Taliban in Pakistan. The Taliban only makes out 1-3% to of the population, yet they have caused a civil war. It is apparent that dimitude in a bunkered society is the new reality as long as Islam, and individual Muslims, are allowed to move freely in our societies. Our major cities will remain broken as long as multiculturalism is allowed to be the prevalent ideology, as long as cultural Marxists are allowed to set the agenda. 15 years, when I was 15, time, 20.00 attempted robbery by Pakistani gang outside a concert. Luckily for me I knew a hardcore Pakistani thug, from the Pakistani gang in Oslo, who told them I was under his protection. There have been approximately 10 other threatening situations where me and my friends were unharmed. 16 years, time, 16.30 assault, an older and much stronger slash bigger Pakistani hit me without provocation in front of Major Shuan Husset. Apparently, he wanted to subdue me in front of my friend Arsalan who apparently had told him to do it. This concluded, for my part, my friendship with him and I reconnected with my old friends after this incident. However, this restricted my territorial freedoms, as I was no longer under the protection of the Oslo Ummah. From now on we would have to arm ourselves whenever we went to parties in case Muslim gangs showed up and we usually chose to stay in our neighborhoods on Oslo West. 17 years, time, a 1.30 attempted assault and robbery, us two, them three, two Pakistanis and one wannabe Pakistani. We were actually heading home after being on the same party together. 
The wannabe Pakistani suddenly turned on me without provocation and rallied the other two. Me and my friend had to run as we were unarmed at the time. 17 years, time, 23.30 assault and attempted robbery, us 10, them 12 Moroccans. Location Tassin, Oslo. They were robbing, collecting jizya, and beating local KAFR slash Norwegian kids at Tassin Center, they had done this on numerous occasions. They didn't live there but traveled to Tassin from a Muslim enclave on Oslo East. I was at a party on Tassin when we heard they had just beaten one of my friend's younger brothers. We went there to chase them away from the neighborhood. They had weapons, we had weapons. I was hit with a billiard pool in the head. Result of the fight, we made a deal with them, they promised they would never return and harass the Tassin youngsters again. 18 years, time, 01.00 assault by Pakistani gang outside a club. A friend of mine was attacked without provocation by a gang of six. I told him to run as they outnumbered us. Result, broken nose. 19 years, time, 02.00 attempted robbery by two Pakistanis at a bar. I had my friends nearby so I told them to fuck off or I we would bash their faces in, an effective psychological deterrent, most Pakistani thugs have a Neanderthal mentality so to show weakness will only invite to abuse etc. Pakistanis are usually a lot more cowardly than Northern African Muslims though, I wouldn't have tried that strategy on Moroccans. 20 years, time, 22.00 threats and attempted assault, us 3, M4. Me and two friends were about to order at Burger King when a Norwegian girl crossed the food queue. As she went by she pushed me, saying, move, you piece of shit. Needless to say, I was very surprised and I managed to stutter the words, suck my dick, bitch, while perplexed. She ran over to her friends, four Moroccans sitting at a corner and just waiting to pick a fight. They approached me, I was alone at the time, and told me they were going to fuck me up severely as soon as I left Burger King. I had tear gas on me, as I always have when going out late. However, I decided to go with the deterrent strategy, so I called my two friends, Erling, a relatively small adopted Colombian, and his friend a relatively big Christian Ugandan. Having established my deterrent, and obviously not interested in fighting these savages, as is my policy with all Muslim bullies under normal circumstances, I went ahead and started negotiating, offering the Muslim whore an apology. End result was, we left as a group and had the Muslims follow us until we managed to lose them. The most annoying things about the encounter is that you really can't control when you bump into them again. Luckily, a majority of Muslim savages like them live on the east side of town. 21 years, time, 01.30 attempted assault and robbery, us four, them four. Me and my best friends, Peter, Marius and Martin were out clubbing and drinking. This was actually the first time I smoked, normal cigarettes, and I fainted for a few seconds outside a store not far from the club. This was the first and only time I have fainted in my life btw, lol. Apparently, four Albanian Muslims saw this incident and figured I would make an easy target. All four of them approached me and tried to rob me. At that time my friends just arrived and they started to threaten them as well as one of them pulled out a knife. Obviously, we didn't want to fight these savages, so we said we would take out some cash for them in an ATM in the nearby Burger King. We called the police as soon as we entered. However, this was Saturday night so we had no luck getting a response. We ordered some food and stayed at Burger King for a little more than an hour, at which point the Muslim savages had left, probably busy robbing other victims. While I am not so gullible as to take ABB's autobiography as gospel, it's also obvious that he has neither the literary talent nor the imagination to invent these squalid realities. Robert Spencer and his ilk also need to face another obvious fact, none of this has anything whatsoever to do with the Quran, jizya or no jizya. I've been relieved of my lunch money. Who in America hasn't? I'm pretty sure none of the collectors had any familiarity with the surahs whatsoever. This is not Muslim behavior. It is human behavior. The trouble with Oslo isn't that the Norwegian Workers' Party has imported a Muslim underclass, it's that the Norwegian Workers' Party has imported an underclass. If for whatever reasons they'd chosen their immigrants from Papua New Guinea, perhaps Robert Spencer could have become an expert in penis sheaths, noting that all the offenders had wrapped their junk in banana leaves. Instead of converting them to Christianity, he'd want to convert them to underwear. Perhaps not every population can be civilized, every population can be feralized. It is impossible to separate Brevik the hip-hop Norwega tagger from Brevik the Knight Templar. In both we see characteristic fauna of our era, one common and the other rare, both absolutely normal. If you ask a lot of people to be angry about the Bronxification of East Oslo, someone is going to act on it. The goal of trumpeting is to obtain power, and the means of power is violence. 
To denounce violence is to renounce power. To renounce power is to surrender. So it simply won't wash for conservatives to describe this act as senseless or random or inexplicable, like all those inexplicable liberal-inspired terrorists. Much if not most black-on-white violence in America is best characterized as terrorism, because it proceeds from military, not avaricious or psychopathic, motives, nor will it work to ruin justice but suggest that, like Christ, Christians should turn the other cheek. Christ was Christ, perhaps, but humans are humans. And besides, didn't he bring not peace but a sword? Rather, a right that seeks to win power must accept that violence is a normal, essential and ineradicable aspect of human psychology, as it accepts every other reality. Fantasy is a luxury the powerless cannot afford. Denouncing violence in general is either supine, if sincere or mendacious, if insincere, and both are equally fantastic and unaffordable. If you demand power, you are demanding violence, since power constitutes the ability to execute violence. If you are not demanding power, what are you demanding? Why are you even talking? But there is a difference between right and left, and it's just not that the left is in and the right is out. The right stands for order and the left for chaos. Violence is essential to both, but certainly not the same kind of violence. The left, hilariously still named the Norwegian Workers' Party they should really update their name to match their clients, brought A. Gangen and V. Gangen to Oslo. And the right? There is no Norwegian right. Just Norwegian gangsters, a sea gang if you will. An ABB knows Oslo needs order, but all he can think to do about it is a spectacular gang massacre, basically a giant drive-by. In his heart he's still a tagger. And a Robert Spencer? Tom Paine with a tame Quran. Leftism has devoured our entire civilization, which exists only in its belly. Can violence bring order to Oslo? Or to Baltimore? Nothing is more certain. Will it? Well, I hope so. I'm not too optimistic at present. Will it involve the mother of all drive-bys? It most certainly will not.